went fossil digging out west. That's pretty cool. How are you guys doing? Artificial selection? All right. It was 200 degrees? That's too hot. All right. So, how many of you like to ride your bikes? A little bit. Sort of in between. Okay. I love to ride my bike. I ride my bike pretty much every day. And when I was a kid, I loved to ride my bike. When I was a kid, pretty much everything I had to do in my life, my school, my church, most of my friends, all within about a mile of my house, so I could ride my bike pretty much anywhere I wanted to. And I often did. And sometimes me and my friends would have contests to see who could do the longest wheelies. Anybody good at doing wheelies? No? Oh, the trick is you got to keep pedaling while you're up. If you stop pedaling, you go right down. To the Dollar Tree? Okay, cool. And we would often, my friends and I would find things to use as ramps to jump off of. Anybody jump with your bike on ramps? Once. All right, pro tip, don't tell your parents I told you this. But if you have a curb in front of your house, your driveway, the corner of your driveway, is a ramp. You can jump off that sucker and you can get so much air, it's cool. When I was 13, maybe 12, 12 or 13, I actually won a bike in a drawing. It was an 18-speed Huffy Mountain bike. It was yellow and black, and it was amazing. I loved that bike. And I rode it all over the place. And one day, my mom and my sister went to go visit some friends who were camping about 30 miles away. And I was what you might call a portly young lad. That means I was fat. And my mom would try to trick me into exercising. So she found a payphone. Do you guys know what a payphone is? There's a phone. You could drop some money in it and call whoever you wanted. It was way cooler than a smartphone. Sorry you guys missed out. But my mom calls me, and she says, I bet you can't ride your bike out here. And I said, oh, yeah, Mom? I bet I can. Yeah, I was that dumb. I fell for it that easily. I got this 18-speed Huffy mountain bike. Of course I can do this. But you know what my first problem was? I had an 18-speed Huffy mountain bike. If anybody dares you to ride 30 miles on a Huffy mountain bike, don't do it. It is not a bike designed for riding 30 miles. But I don't know this yet, so I'm up for the challenge. And it's really hot out, and I got pants on, so I'm like, eh, I gotta put some shorts on. And I got some shorts that are good for biking, but I know I want to bring some money with me, which means I need shorts that have pockets. So I put on a pair of jean shorts. And if you don't know why this is a bad idea, when you get home today, take a pair of jeans and rub them on your arm really hard for four hours. Don't do that because it's going to burn you. But I don't know this, so I put on my jean shorts, I put my money in the pocket, and I start pedaling. And about five miles in, I'm realizing it's hot. I probably should have brought something to drink. And then you had to go back to I didn't go back, because I had money in my pocket. So I stop to a gas station, and I look for the perfect beverage with which to hydrate, and I find it. Mountain Dew. It's got caffeine to give me energy. It's going to quench my thirst. I don't want to sleep. I got to bike 30 miles. Well, I don't think that's a problem. But what was a problem, you know what the Mountain Dew did to me? No, it made me thirstier. And I didn't realize why at the time. I thought it was just because I was hot and thirsty. But the sugar in the Mountain Dew made me thirstier. But alas, I keep pedaling. And I'm riding along, and about 10 miles in, I'm way out of anywhere I've ever ridden before. And I'm used to roads that look like this. And all of a sudden, I hit roads that look like this. And I have to go up these things called hills that I'm not familiar with. And I realize quickly that I hate hills. This mountain bike that I have is not good at shifting. It makes going up these hills much harder. And going down hills is fun, but then I gotta go up another hill. 
and it's not fun, and I hate hills, and I miss the flatlands that I lived in. And I'm still riding. I'm hurting. My legs are getting burned from my jean shorts. I'm thirsty. I don't have much money left, but I need something more to drink, and I know there's a gas station coming up that has cans of soda for 25 cents, and I can afford that. I can't afford anything else, but I can afford that. No, water would have cost me money. It would have cost more than 25 cents. So I get in, go to this gas station, buy some more soda, I drink that, and I just keep pedaling. And this bike ride, every decision I made was wrong. Even if I had the perfect bike, I still neglected to bring water. I brought money to buy water, and when I had the chance to buy water, I bought soda. I wore jean shorts instead of shorts that I should have worn. Every decision that I had to do this task at hand was the wrong one. Did you know that as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, God gives us tools to do our jobs? And we have a choice of whether or not we use them. Let me get to the next page. In Ephesians 6, we read, Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. So what do you guys know about the full armor of God? Nothing? I think Dave talked about it last week. No? Okay. So in verse 14, it says, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. So the belt of truth, what is a belt used for? To keep your shorts on. Yeah, you don't want to take on the devil's schemes with your shorts falling down. They just look at you and be like, Evelyn, your shorts are falling down. What are you going to do? No, that's not what this belt is for. All the stuff that Paul's talking about here is stuff that these people would have seen on a Roman soldier. So what would a belt be used for on a Roman soldier? Anybody know? Yeah, to carry your weapons. So they would have their sword on there. They'd have some other weapons in there. It might help to keep some of the rest of the uniform in place. But if they don't have their belt, they're useless. Because they don't have their tools then. And just like a Christian, we're told to have the belt of truth. And the truth is in the word of God. And every, every day in the world, the world says that there's things that really aren't that big of a deal. But you know what? The Bible says differently. And the Bible is true. And we have to focus on what the Bible says. And if we stand firm with the belt of truth and studying what's in the Bible and living by the truths that are in the Bible, that's the way that God wants us to live. And that's going to be an excellent tool for your fight against the devil. At the end of verse 14, it says to have the breastplate of righteousness in place. Do you guys know what a breastplate is, breastplate is for? It's, it's like a breastplate. Yeah. It covers, um, it covers the area until it's like some unidentified Yep. Right. So these soldiers, their arms would have been exposed and their legs would have been exposed. They might get cuts on their arms and legs, but usually that's, they're going to live through that. But if they got hit in the heart, they're done. So the breastplate protects their heart and makes sure that they don't get stabbed in the heart. Likewise, we have to keep our breastplate on. And I got to find my notes here. It's too windy up here. So we're going to go through some bad experiences in our lives. And if we leave our heart unguarded against evil, we're really going to have problems. So we need to protect our hearts. And as followers of Christ, we should want to live a righteous life. We should want to do what is right and good according to God's word. And we should avoid what the Bible says is evil. And if we live like this, we're protecting our spiritual hearts, just like a breastplate from the damage that sin can inflict on our hearts. In verse 15, we're told to have our feet fitted with the gospel shoes of peace. That sounds kind of weird, but when I was a kid, I had a friend with a pool, actually one of the same friends that I was riding my bike to go visit that day, and they had these little rocks around the pool. And in those rocks, they had stepping stones. And my friend, she would just run across these little rocks, and I don't know how she did it, because my little princess feet, when I stepped on those rocks, it hurt so bad. So I knew that if I was walking through there, I had to step on the stepping stones or I had to wear shoes. 
And similarly, these soldiers, they would have to walk through all sorts of places and there'd be little rocks and they'd have to worry about stepping on them. So they'd wear shoes to keep their feet protected. So we're told to wear the gospel shoes of peace. And anybody know what the word gospel means? Nope, it's not hard to define. It means good news. And what is the good news? Aiden? The Bible? More importantly, we have a Savior who has paid the penalty for our sins. Jesus. And if we accept him as our Savior, someday we're going to be in a place that is absolutely perfect. That is the good news. And that should bring you a sense of peace. And that's what the gospel shoes of peace are all about. In verse 17, it says we should have the helmet of salvation. So we talked about the breastplate and how it protects your heart, but the soldiers also had to protect their heads. If they got hit in the head, that's, that's not good news. Yep, you don't want to get hit with rocks. So likewise, as Christians, we should be protecting our minds. So being confident that God has saved you and has forgiven you of your sins is the best way to defend your mind from the lies and the challenges that the devil is going to try to attack you with. When you ask Jesus to be your Savior, things may not always go the way you want them to go, but we're saved from our own sin. And all the evil that's around the world from us, we're saved from that too. And that's some really great protection. And finally, at the end of verse 17, it tells us to take up the sword of the Spirit, which it says is the Word of God. Now, all the other things we talked about are defensive. They're there to protect us. we got a helmet to protect our head, a breastplate. We've got shoes, we've got a belt to hold it all in place. But this one is the fun one. This is the one where we get to go on the offensive. We get to attack. So it says the word of God is the sword of the spirit. Satan knows the word of God. He knows the word of God is true, but he hates to hear it from you. And when you use the word of God against Satan, it's like you're stabbing Satan back. You're attacking him. And that's the best weapon that we have. You put those all together, and it's a pretty amazing combination of things. You're still thinking of iron? Yeah. Okay. So going back to that long bike ride I was on, I was about 25 or 26 miles into this ride. I was tired. My body hurt. I was hot. My legs were literally burned from my shorts. I was overwhelmingly thirsty. I didn't know how I was going to go on. And all of a sudden, my mom's car pulled up. I was saved. I got to put my bike in the car. I got to sit in a really comfortable seat. The car had air conditioning. She had water. Nothing else that happened in the past mattered at that point in time. Life was perfect again. It didn't matter that when my mom drove to the end of Lake Michigan Drive where I knew we had to turn right, she turned left. I would have gone the wrong direction. That no longer mattered. Life was perfect. And let's say I had the world's most perfect bike. Let's say I brought water with me. Let's say I wore the right clothes. Would my ride have been perfect then, right? No, not necessarily. What if my tire went flat? What if I wiped out and got hurt? We didn't have cell phones back then, and I really was riding in the middle of nowhere. So there wasn't going to be anybody to help me. No internet. That was still in its infancy, yes. But if I had all that stuff, even if it may not have been perfect, it probably would have been much better than what I did. Similarly, God gives us his spiritual armor. And we have a choice whether or not to use it. And you can try your life without it, but I wouldn't recommend it. Even if you use all his armor at all times, is your life going to be perfect? No. Unfortunately, we live in an imperfect world. Because of sin, we're all going to face different hardships in our life. But dressing ourselves in the full armor of God is when we have the best chance at this life. But someday, just like that bike ride when my mom suddenly pulled up and picked me up and everything was perfect, someday Jesus is going to come back. And if you're a follower of Jesus, he's going to pick you up. Everything's going to be perfect. But until then... I challenge you to dress yourselves in the full armor of God and go be amazing soldiers in the Lord's army. Thank you.